All right, good morning again. Not really again for me, but again to you. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. It is homecoming day, right? And if you're following along, this is where we start to tell, right, who actually has been reading their devotionals, right? And I'm excited to see so many people here today because this whole week, right, you knew I was coming today. Shuford calls me and he's like, man, I'm just waiting to see how you're going to preach a homecoming sermon on giving, right? And I was like, well, you know, first we, you know, you don't get a plate for food unless you put something in the plate. <laughs> and we just go from there. No, I'm just kidding. Some of you are like, dang, I'm just kidding. I promise I'm just kidding. We'll find out about that as we go in. You know, truly when we start talking about this, we've been going through our, our series called Next, Right. And when we did this, we recognized um, through the book of Acts these traits of the New Testament church. We were looking for some things about the New Testament church that kind of identified with them specifically. What was special about this group of believers, right? What is it about them that's sometimes lacking in church today? Um, If you spend any time in any seminary church or anything like that, people, uh, you know, say, you know, we want to be that New Testament church. We want to be like the church in the book of Acts. And and who wouldn't, right? We we talked about the fact that, you know, from the very beginning, they started with 120 people, right, and grew to a worldwide movement, right, that would just change the economic system, change the calendar, change how people worshipped, how people did their and lived their weeks. I mean, messed up this world. It was awesome, As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, the the Christians, they look at them and they say, these are these people, right, that are just crazy, right? And they're making this world crazy. And this group of 120, how did this happen, right? How do we do that? What what are we missing today that, that they had? And we kind of recognize these really six traits, right, core values, if you will, for the New Testament church, things that they did that they held dear. And we saw or kind of recognize how those core values shaped into actions, right? There is nothing that is going to truly convict you or shape you that's not going to be revealed in your actions, right? We talk about that all the time. We want to be love in action. It's an overflow of the love of God. Loving Him completely ourselves correctly and others compassionately is love in action. You can't not, right? We talk about these things all the time. And it's the same thing with these traits, right? They, they boiled over, they overflowed into actions. Um, the, really, the first one we talked about was this idea of dedication. And dedication is really the umbrella, right, of every single trait. The reason that there are results from these core values that the New Testament church had, right, are because they were dedicated to them. So our very first week we talked about the difference between dedication, right, and commitment, Right? We want to be committed, but we also, more importantly, want to be dedicated members of a church. Remember, dedication says I have to, right? Or commitment says I have to. Dedication rather says I get to, I love to, I want to, right? I can't not. So that's kind of the umbrella that we picture all of these different um, characteristics through. And we talked about kind of the, the top down, right? The first and foremost, they were Christ-centered, Right? They were focused on Christ, Christ-like lives, right? in Christ. We talked about the fact that when you look at the Scripture in the New Testament church, they're only called Christians two times. Right, That's where they get their identity. It's two times they're actually called out as Christians. The rest of the Bible, a Christian's identity right, is not found in what they're called, but who they're in. Over 216 times in the New Testament were referred to as in Christ. So what happens when we're in Christ? What happens when we're so vertically focused? And two big things happen that I think kind of spill out into everything else and kind of encompass everything else that that church is. And when I say church, remember, this is for you if you've never been here before. When I talk about church, I don't mean 511 Tucker Siege Road, right? I mean you if you are a follower of Christ because you are part of the body of Christ. You are his church. And two big ones we talked about last week was service. And I just want to thank everybody who signed up. Um, it was our Cannonball Sunday. We talked about serving and service. And, I mean, I think we filled over almost 200 different types of positions in the church, right, were filled because of you guys signing up. And, and I've already had several people that came Wednesday and came other times and said, where can we sign up? We missed. And when you stop out at the hub, right, you can come see me after church. We'll give you some of these, right? You can fill them out while you're um, eating your casseroles and your banana pudding. It's okay if you get some on there. We'll 
scrape it off. It's okay. All right, but there's places for you to serve, right? And godly service flows out of a life that is vertically focused, that's centered on him. There's another trait that comes out of this. And a vertically focused life leads us to vertical giving. All right, a Christ-focused life leads to vertical giving. And we start talking about giving and we, we hear about it. And some of you, maybe if this is your first time here at the church, you know, you're like, oh, here we go again. And maybe some of you are like, this is what I was waiting on, right? And we're going to maybe kind of back off and kind of maybe dispel some of your misconceptions about church and giving, right? And let me do this too, right? And the other side of that, some of you, right, have been in church all your life and we're going to dispel some of the misconceptions you have about giving as well. I want to talk a little bit about it. You know, um, Matt sent me this this week. You know, giving is a major, if not the key theme to Scripture. If we think about the gospel and we think about um, everything kind of spilling out from John 3.16, right? John 3.16 is kind of the synopsis of God's grace. God's grace, right, the gospel is all about giving. For God so loved the world that he Oh, it's the play-at-home version, and you did good. That he gave. Giving begins with God. Matt sent these stats to me. I think they're really cool. The, the, the word believe or the theme about belief and prayer and love. Belief shows up about 339 times in the Bible. Uh, prayer shows up 545 times. Love, 643. It, the Bible speaks of this theme of giving 2,158 times. Right? So when you hear a church preach about or a pastor preach about giving, here's why. Because God did it first. And if they're preaching this book, they're going to preach about giving. You can't preach this book. You can't preach about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the wonderful gospel of God's grace on us, and not speak about giving. Why do we talk about money? Because Jesus did. Right? Why do we talk about money? See, number one. Because Jesus did. Why do we talk about these things? It's a true and practical application message. Why do sermons on giving and tithing and things like that, why do they, why do they gripe us sometimes? Why do they bother us so much? Because here's the thing, right? When I preach on the Holy Spirit, right? When I preach on the love of God, these are all things that, you know, love in your neighbor. These are all things that you can just practically, you know, you can go and do them on your own. There's no real... From my side, right? I just take your word at it. There's no fruit to that. When you preach about giving and tithing, there is a practical application that comes from that. And here's the thing. We put it in our bulletin every week. All right? So when people come and say, man, that was, that was a great sermon on giving, Pastor, and then nothing changes in your life, we see that. Right? We know that. God knows that. It takes something from us. Even serving, right? We can serve, right? Check it off once a month. Right? Go to Gastonia Street Ministries. Right? Go to the CRO. Take my time down in the nursery. God bless you, nursery workers. Man, work with homeless shelters, homeless people, drug addicts, right? prisoners, all that kind of crazy stuff in my life. I don't want to go to the nursery. <laughs> so you people preach. right? I love you guys too. But I'm saying you can do that. Check it off your list. But giving it, it, it becomes a lifestyle too, right? And it's very, it, it gets to you because you know it. You know, we say it all the time. You know, I can tell and see what's going on in your life if I look at your calendar, right, and your bank statement, right? I can see what's important in your life. And here's the thing. Christ talks about this. And probably one of, if not the standard for every sermon that will ever be preached from here until eternity, Christ's Sermon on the Mount. And it's found in, in Matthew chapter 6, and I put uh, some no in your notes there, I put kind of an excerpt from Matthew 6, 19 through 25 and 31 through 33. So let's, let's stand as we read God's word and really get going this morning. And let me paint the picture for you here. Christ is speaking at the um, Sermon on the Mount, and when he begins this, right, with the Beatitudes and all those things, I just want you to understand the audience, right? The audience was mixed with Jews and Greeks, followers and non-followers, but when he speaks the Sermon on the Mount, he says these words. He says, this is what it is, right? Basically, if you're a disciple of mine. So these are words to followers of Christ, right? So we see this first and foremost. This is words from him to his disciples. If you call yourself a disciple of mine, this is what your life should look like. It's a revolutionary. 
Um, we actually did a series called Revolution, and we went all through, verse by verse, the Sermon on the Mount. You can grab it from our podcast or from the website, and, and I recommend that you do. But I want to read this section here. Verse 9 of chapter 6. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves neither break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on it. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that every dot and tittle of it is useful for correcting and rebuking, for training up your disciples so that we can be prepared for the good works that you have for us. And God, as we come together with the notion now, Lord, of food that awaits us, God, I just pray that you would keep us focused, Lord, on, on your lesson that you have for us today. Reminded each and every one of us that we are here for a purpose, that a word is to be given to us today from you, and we thank you for that. And God, I pray now that you would open up our eyes, that we would see you, our ears, that we would hear you, and our hearts, that we would willingly accept the word and the work that you have for us. God, I thank you for the men and women who have gathered in this place for the past 102 years. God, for the prayers that were laid out during these last four years and the 100 years before that, God. May we always bring you honor and glory in everything that we do. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we start talking about money, right? And, and, and truly, let me say this too. Just as we talk about homecoming, right? I, I, I'm so excited. It's amazing what God's doing. From one homecoming to the next, just one year from the next, there are great things going on at Tucker Siege Baptist. Guys, I, I just want to kind of just from me to you, Thank you for every single thing that you've done this year and everything that you've already signed up to do in the next year. Um, because of what you already do, right? Because of what you already do. These are some of the things that we've been able to do year to date. When you give, you fund every single ministry that we have here, our children's, our youth, vacation Bible schools. You help fund these things. Let me give you just a little breakdown, some monetary numbers for you here. We've given over $6,253 away nationally. We've given $8,200 away locally to the local Baptist missions, to the CRO, to the Gastonia Street Ministries, King's Daughters, Crisis Pregnancy. We've given almost $2,000 away from inside our church to people in our church who needed it. We call that benevolence. I call it church. We've given all in total, guys, We've given just monetary, right, just monetary, over $16,000, almost $17,000 away this year. Dude, that didn't even count, right, more than 7,000 meals that we've prepared in the last year and a half, right? It doesn't even count all the thousands of volunteer hours that so many of you have put in. Guys, we are doing what we say we're supposed to do, and I thank you for that. I, somebody said one time, and I read it in, in, a, in a sermon on money, and I, and I think it's true, and deacons will probably hate me after I say this. I'm never going to sit up here and say we can't do something that God wants us to do if you don't give. All right? When we start talking about money, we're not going to be able to do, we're not, not going to do something that God wants us to do because of money. God is going to provide a way. He has provided a way. All of this stuff that we talked about, here's the thing about Tucker Siege. Our giving, right, to others is up. When you include meals and all this stuff up, our giving to others outside of our church is up more than we've probably ever done. I know in the last four years, maybe the last 40 years. 
our actual income is down 15%. Our actual take-in is down 15%. Our attendance is up over the last four years 30%. Our giving is down 15%. And people say, why does this happen? Why does this happen? Let me tell you why. When church turn around, right, church plants and things like that, there's, there's one rule of the wallet, all right? The wallet is the first thing to go and the last thing to come. When you come into church, the first thing to go when you're on your way out is your money. And the last thing to come when you're on your way in is your money. But let me tell you this, all right? This is something that I've learned in, in my time. To me, I would rather have... A hundred people who needed to be disciple, discipled about the importance of giving, all right, than a thousand people, all right, who need to be disciplined because they find their importance in their giving. Why do we say that? Why do we talk about that? Because vertical giving, right, after, right out of the start, guys, vertical giving, Christ said it there, is a matter of the heart. You see, guys, God is not after your money. He's after your heart. You can clap. Hand clap for Jesus. It's okay. We can get Pentecostal. All right? It's all right. I'm, I'm cool with that. You ain't going to mess me up. Now, if y'all start clapping in rhythm and stuff, that might get me out, but that's all right. God's not after your money. He's after your heart. Let me kind of put it this way, too, because let me tell you something. And, and sit down. You already are, so you're good. God don't need your money. Okay? Everything, when we talk about money, when we talk about giving, when we talk about this stuff, it's the blessing that you can receive when you give. Let me unpack this for parents because y'all get this. I heard this analogy and then I saw it last night when we was at the Sims barbecue thing and dancing and all that fun stuff. You can watch those videos. <laughs> you ever been through the drive through right, with your kid? And you go through the drive-thru, and this has happened to me before, right? Grace, I love her to death, but she's like one of those people she don't like to drink after people, right? She'll eat after everybody, but won't. I'm just like, dude, really? That just don't make sense to me. But anyway, but have you ever done that like as a parent, right? And you're like, hey, can I have some of your drink? Because, you know, you didn't get you a drink. They got, they got their little Happy Meal, and you want some of their drink. And you're just like, hey, can I have some of your drink? Now, see, there's a false truth there. Because I just said, can I have some of your drink? Who bought that drink? <laughs> right? Whose drink is that? And she says, no. You see, she's forgotten three key points about that drink, right? I bought the drink. It's my drink. Second key point she has forgotten. I'm bigger than her. If I want that drink, I can take the drink. It was a courtesy of me to ask her for a swallow of her Coca-Cola. Third, if I really had to, right, I could throw down a piece of plastic and buy out some Chick-fil-A Coca-Cola and just dump it in the ground because I could get so much of it. I don't need her drink. I asked for it. Now flip that around to our finances. God don't want your money. He wants your heart. You see, Jesus told us, he said, right here, you know, where your heart is, there your money is. But think about this. There are two obstacles that I note in this passage to giving. Two obstacles that I see here. Obstacles to giving are greed and fear. I heard Tim Keller talk about this one time. Tim Keller's a great Presbyterian minister, um, redeemed uh, Presbyterian church in um, New York City. Just a, a great, great man. And he said it this way. He said that he was doing a series on the seven deadly sins. And he said, his wife said, well, let me know how many people come when you get to greed. And he said, okay. And she said, it's not because everybody is convicted about it. It's because nobody thinks they're greedy. Right? We don't think about greed because we don't know that we're greedy. Jesus said that when it is in here, this light that's in here, if you look in your notes, he said, this eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is bad... Your whole body is full of darkness. Greed blinds us to the sin of greed. Maybe you track with this, right? When you mess up, right? We call that sin. When you mess up, you know that you messed up. If you are in adultery, you know you're in adultery, right? 
When, when you say something you shouldn't, when your heart's not right and something comes out of your mouth, when that dude cuts you off and you tell him where he should go and how to get there and on what horse he should ride, <laughs> right? You're immediately convicted about that because you're like, man, I can't believe that. I can't believe I said that, right? Things in that life, those sins in our life, they show up and they reveal themselves in their very nature. But greed by itself doesn't reveal itself that, in that way. Why? Because we always think it's somebody else. It's the rich people that are greedy, holding the little man down, right? Holding me down. That's the rich people that are greedy. But guess what? Here's the thing. I want you to understand this. Greed has nothing to do with the size of your wallet, but the clenched fist of your hand, right? Jesus taught us this. Here's the great thing I've loved when I learned about this. And here's the big deal, and y'all should be scared, right? Because I've got so much stuff on, on giving, and the Bible is so full of it. It's like, we've got to do a series on this, right? But we just got that much time. It's homecoming. Get you fed, so we're going to get through this. The Bible doesn't care and does not label people rich or poor when it comes to money. Righteous and unrighteous. It's not a rich or poor thing when it comes to giving. It's righteous or unrighteous. Where's your heart at? What is your treasure? What do you treasure in your life? Because your treasure is going to dictate your actions, right? And when there's greed there, you're going to hold it tight, right? You're going to be close fist. And there are righteous rich who do everything right. They do everything. They make godly money. They give it back. They give it out and do it. There's unrighteous rich who make their money off the, the, the backs of the oppressed and who do evil dealings and things like that. And there are righteous poor who are just in the place that God has allowed them to be in. And, and they understand that. And they have this joy in that position. And they give freely of whatever it is that they have to give. Right? And there's unrighteous poor. Right? Who are poor because they like being poor. They like manipulating the system. There's greedy poor people and there's greedy rich people. Greed is not a rich and poor thing. It's an unrighteous, righteous thing. It's a matter of the heart. And the other thing he talks about here is fear, right? Fear is a big reason, right? Fear, here's the thing. Greed is materialism, is idolatry, okay? Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Fear is a lack of faith. Because you're saying when God says all of these things to you and says this is what it is, right? When he says don't be anxious for anything. If you have a, um, maybe NIV it says don't worry about anything. Now, let me stop right here. Take this, write this down. All right, circle it, whatever you got to do. Jesus said don't worry. He did not say don't work. All right? We need to hear that. God said, don't worry. He didn't say, kick back, right, in the lazy boy, and I'm just going to rain down manna from heaven. Even in Exodus, when God rained down manna from heaven, they had to get out the tent and go pick it up. And if they wanted to be lazy and pick up more than they, so they didn't have to pick up the next day, guess what happened? It rotted. He said, I'm going to give you enough every single day for what you need. He says, don't worry. Not, don't work. There's still effort involved. He still wants us to be out there doing things. Uh, the Apostle Paul said, right, if a man doesn't work, man shouldn't eat. Now, if a man can't work, it's a totally different thing. And there's service and there's giving, and that's where that comes in. But there's this idea of fear. I can't do it. One of the great stories and illustrations I've ever heard was a pastor who's, who was, gave this big sermon on giving. He's sitting out the back door, and this guy walks by, and he said, Preacher, he said, man, he said, I loved your sermon today, and it convicted me. He said, I just don't know about all these monthly bills that come in, and I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to pay it. And, and Preacher said, I tell you what, dude, he said, you make an honest, concerted effort, right, that you're going to, you know, truly do tithing and giving and go through these things. He said, but I want you to, at the end of the month, whatever bills you can't pay, you bring them to me and I'll pay them. I'm not doing this. <laughs> and the guy was like, preacher, you're going to do that for me? He says, I can't believe that, man. I said, I couldn't ask him. I, Wow. That's amazing. And the preacher looked at him and said, now, son, because older Baptist preachers call everybody son. He said, son, how is it you can trust me, a mortal man, right, but you don't trust God? 
You see, I don't understand how it is we trust God with these life-altering, eternal consequences, right, like salvation, and then the smaller things like your bank account and your budget and your life and everything else, you're like, no, i, I got to handle this. This is too much for you, right? Why do we do that? Because of fear. And God told us, Jesus said, right, don't be anxious of these things. God knows that you need these things. Does it mean that it's going to show up? Uh, 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 no, it means that he's going to give you exactly what you need for that day, exactly when you need it, right? God would say, test me on this. Some of you are too scared to test him on that. And, and you hear, um, you know, you hear these testimonies of people who said, you know, we've given and we do these things. And, and sometimes you look at people, some people, when they talk about giving, and most of the time it is the older people. And you're like, well, of course you're giving, right? You ain't got half the stuff I got going on in my life and stuff. And you're retired. So, you got, and so I want you to understand, I, I can remember when Emily and I made this concerted effort and we said, we're going to do this, right? We're going we're gonna to give. God's, I mean, and, and we were in this place in our life, you know, just vertical, right? And we said, we're going to start really, truly tithing, all right? And, and let me say this too, right? I think this is kind of important to understand that there is giving that is actually serving, right? But when we start talking about this, we're talking about tithing, like what comes to the church, right, to help us go. Because these cool, you know, devotions that we hand out, right, these cards that you fill out, these lights that stay on, Right? That's what you support when you support the church, right? The things that we do over and beyond. But Emily and I made this concerted effort, right? We're going we're gonna to do this. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do this tithing like we're supposed to do, like God calls us to do, like our hearts lead us to do. And not long after we did all this, got a house and everything's going great. And, and just I, I tell you all this to show you that it doesn't necessarily mean that your life's just going to be all unicorns and rainbows. Unicorns, rainbows, that's happy stuff. If you ain't got a nine-year-old daughter, maybe that, sorry. And I lost my job, right? I lost my job. And I, we've talked about that before. For, for six months, I was out of work. And you know what we did every, every week still? We made sure we put that money aside that we knew we had for God. And can I tell you something? Every single bill we had was paid, right? And you could look through my checkbook and you can tell what's important to me, Right? I've got a lot of different investments, you know, with retirement stuff when I had like a real job that did investments and stuff like that. I lose money on all those investments. Can I tell you the one investment that I've never lost money in is Tucker Siege Baptist Church. This is the only place, this is the only place that I'm putting my money that's got a 30% return right now, right? And getting better every week. If you want to invest in something, invest in God's church, invest in the lives of your community and your people. You see, when we talk about this idea of where your treasure is, there your heart is, here's the truth. You're going to die for your treasure. Every treasure demands your death to obtain it, but here's the kicker. Jesus is the only treasure who died to purchase you. Jesus died to purchase you. He gave everything. He gave it all for you. You see, when we understand that a vertical focus leads to generosity. Because a Christ-centered life, a life that loves as he loved, that serves as he serves, gives as he gave. I, I didn't put this in your notes, but just if you have your Bibles, 2 Corinthians 8, chapter 8, verse 9. I, just want, I want to read this for you guys. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. How awesome a thought is that? So when we think about vertical giving, we give because Christ did. We do what Christ did. We give and live a life the way he did. When we're so focused on him, this is what happens. So now we start saying, well, where's practical application? And this is what we talk about, you know, when I want, this is the hard part of the giving service. Because we all make great hearers, right? And then sometimes we want to hear what we want to hear, right? Even people who have been giving or people who need to give and all these different things, you hear what you want to hear. So let's talk about what it is to be a doer, all right? What do doers do? I put in your notes, 2 Corinthians 9, verses 7 through 8, and, and I love this. Paul writes this, and I'm actually going to start in, in, in verse 6. I'm going to read this for you guys. 
and, and if you want to, you can kind of circle this. This is chapters 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians are just these beautiful, this beautiful picture that Paul writes to the church in Corinth that explains giving, the doctrine of giving and how we do it. But I want to kind of, it's all kind of summed up and brought together here at the end. And I want to read this out for us. And I'm going to start in, in verse 6 of chapter 9. It says, the point is this, right? The point of everything he just told them in chapter 8 about how you give and why you give. He says, the point's this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. If you want to put in your notes there, if you like to write in your Bible, that's called the law of the harvest, right? And you'd have to be raised in Marion to get that, right? That makes sense to us. It's logical. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able, listen, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way, to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God, glorifying God in what we do. By their approval of this service, talking about the church in Macedonia who gave out of their poverty to the church in Jerusalem. He said, by their approval of their service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God, thanks be to God for this inexpressible gift. Paul's describing to the church in Corinth why it is important that we give. You've got to understand, right, ancient Near East economics at this time, Macedonia, a church that he was talking about, Jerusalem, these other cities were, were typically very poor cities, right? And the Bible even talks about, and, and history talks about, that there was a great famine that went on, and there was a lot of economic trouble even in Macedonia at this time. But Corinth was a port city. Um, I like to call it the Las Vegas of the Bible, Right? You know, what, state, what happened in Corinth stayed in Corinth. It was a wild and crazy place. Right? They were known because of their, um, the, 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 they had the big um, monument. No, that's not what they call it. The big shrine. There you go. That's what they call it. The Temple of Artemis. Right? And she was this multi-breasted um, goddess of fertility. And there was a thousand priestly prostitutes at this place. So this was a place of debauchery, but it was also a place of money because it was a port city and money was coming in. Trade was coming in. So they had, and, and Paul's saying and talking to the Corinthians, thanking them for what they are giving and saying, hey, look at this church over here in Macedonia who's giving to the church, right, in Jerusalem, who's giving to the furtherance of the gospel out of what they don't have. But he says, here's it. Here's the stipulations for giving, right? And this is how you do it. If you don't do it like this, you're not doing it right. Yes. Had to think about that for a second. If you're not doing it like this, you're not doing it right. And it doesn't mean that we're not going to take your money. Because all we care is that God be glorified in the end, right? Just kidding. This is the blessing. How do you get the blessing that God talks about, right? Because he doesn't need your money. Giving, the act of giving back to him, right, is a blessing that we receive from him. And he says, this is how you get the blessing. This is how you know you're going to be blessed. When you understand this first and foremost, when we talk about, here's the crutch, right? Everybody's like, well, how much do we give, Jay? Right? 10%, right? I guess that's a starting point. The Old Testament speaks of it. I, I never forget... Um, I think it might have been David Platt or Francis Chan, one of the two, told this story about he had a guy that was coming to their church and he was having kind of a meet and greet. And he said a guy came up to him and he said, you know, man, I really like your church. You don't preach all that law stuff all the time. You know, everybody's always hammering in about all this stuff, you know, the law and, and giving and 10 percent. And uh, the preacher looked at him and was, I think it was Francis Chan. He looked at him and he said, yeah, you know what? He said, you're right. We're a church of grace right? We preach grace. We preach grace in everything. Grace in serving, right? Grace in love, grace in mercy, grace in giving, right? So when we preach grace in giving, you know, hey, we don't stop at 10%. Whatever else you want to give, man, whatever your heart feels like giving, we into that, right? 
Well, what Paul's saying here is it's not about the gift. When we talk about this, how much? It's a matter of grace. It's between you and God, right? If you're married, it's between you, your spouse, and God. You have to make this determination. And Paul earlier talks about, you know, some factors that go into it. You know, as you've been giving, so you give, right? So there's not like, you know, for some people, right, 10% of your income is nothing, right? And, and I mean, I mean it's, nothing, it doesn't, it's nothing for you to give away 10% of your money, right? It, you, you can cut that check, no problem, right? For some of us, if we look at 10% of our checkbook, it's like, that's everything, right? What have you purposed in your heart, right? Here's the kicker with giving. It's all about the attitude. I, I love how Paul writes there in, he says, it's called the cheerful giver, right? He says, each one must give as his heart has decided in his heart, not reluctantly under compulsion because God loves a cheerful giver. Do you understand that word cheerful there? Literally translated means hilarious, right? And some of you are going, if you saw my bank account and asked me to give, it would be hilarious. <laughs> but this is the attitude, right? Is that your attitude when you, when you write the check? Right, I, Bobby always talks about, uh, Bobby Williams does a lot of our finance stuff, and he's told me the story a, a hundred different times about Billy and Ruth Graham, where Billy puts uh, the offerings place that come, plates coming by at a church they're at, right? And, and Billy places some money in there, and later on he's sitting at dinner with, with Ann, uh, and he's like, man, I put $100 in the plate. I meant to give them 10 And And, and Ruth actually... I think that's his wife. Ruth says, that's all right, Billy. You just got credit for 10. <laughs> What's your heart? All right? It's all about the attitude of the giver, too. Don't do it reluctantly, right? When, when the offering plate's coming, right? If they have to, like, pry it from your hand and they're like that, man, just keep it, dude. All right? Because the heart has to be right. Because it's an act of grace. It's a vertical thing. Giving is not a burden, it's a joy. Why? Because it's a spiritual gift, right? It's a fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, all those little things there. Giving a generous heart is evidence of a changed heart. Right? It's the grace of God in you, right? Because you, you understand that it's not yours. You understand that God doesn't need your money. You understand that all he wants is you. All right? God doesn't stop at your bank account. All right? God's shooting a lot higher. He wants your life. And when he has your life, when you love God completely, that all-encompassing word completely takes all of that stuff into account. And here's the thing, guys. If all these things aren't hidden, we're the ones that miss out. We miss out. We miss out on the blessings of giving. We miss out on the, 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 the wonderful joy that is there. We truly, I truly, when I go to Gastonia Street Ministries and I get to hear Miss Gibby and she comes up to me and we send out a check to our, our ministries that we support once a month, and which works out pretty good because it's typically, um, you know, when we're headed up to street ministries. And I go in there and... and and if you've been to street ministries, you'll appreciate this because you know it's true. Pastor Jason, I'm so happy. She's almost crying and she says, we got your check. And it never fails that every time she gets our check, she says, X happened. And your check was exactly what we needed. That's a joy that I want you to get. That's a joy that I want to share with you. That's a joy that God wants you to have because when you don't do this right, when everything is kind of falling apart like this, when you're not vertically focused, when you give, right, when you serve, when you, when you give with the, you know, you know why you give like this with unclenched hands? Because you can't receive when you give with a clenched fist. When you give with open hands, God can place stuff back in your hand. But when it's done begrudgingly, right, when it's a burden and not a joy, you miss out. I was kind of looking around, and I was going through and doing some, some study for this. And this is kind of, it's kind of crazy when, I, when I, I found this this morning. 
It's, it's a Latin phrase. And if you grew up in the Catholic Church, you, you probably know this. It's case ut Deus. Case ut Deus. It's the literal translation of the name Michael. And it means this. Who is like God? That's the ultimate rhetorical question. Case ut Deus. Who is like my God to supply your needs? When you start doing that, when you start thinking about that vertically, who is our God? Who is this God that I serve? It changes everything. It changes everything. Listen, let me hear this. If you're here today, right, the only thing, and you've never, you've never fully given your life over to Christ, You've never made him just the Savior and Lord of your life. I want you to understand one thing. He don't care about your bank account. He Paul would finish his letter to the church in Corinth and he said, Just as you excel in everything, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. The first gift that God wants from you is your life. Everything else will follow. I, I told you earlier, and this is true too, right? That I would rather have 100 people that were focused and had to be discipled about the importance of giving than 1,000 people who found their importance in their giving. Maybe that's you too, right? Maybe you find your importance in your giving and you think by your check you get to tell God what to do. No. Nah. Right? I, I went through that, and I'm still here. Church is still growing. We didn't need their money. God don't need your money. He wants your heart. And when he has your heart, he'll have everything he needs to move his movement forward, to reach this community, to bless this church, Right? to fund the things that we need to do. When we're vertically focused, when we love God completely, everything else spills out. Love and action begins with us. Loving ourselves correctly. Loving each other, brothers and sisters in Christ, and part of that is supporting one another. You're here today, you got a decision to make. All right? Some of you heard this and, and were convicted. All right? And that's okay. You needed to be. Some of you heard this today. Maybe you're now convinced. That's good too. But for others, a very big majority of you, this was confirmation of what you're already doing. And I want to encourage you, keep doing it. Keep doing it. As you abound, just like you excel in everything, in faith, in love, in service, in honor, in mercy, in grace, see that you also excel in this, the grace of giving. Why? Because there's no better test of your faith. There's no, more, no better proof of your heart than when you truly let God. When you let go and let God, it's everything. Let's stand. We're going to pray praise team or the Langs <laughs> they're going to sing right and this is a time for us right this is time for us for dedication for rededication for contemplation maybe it's a time for you to, to come forward right and say I want to be a part of this church maybe you just need to come and, and lay something at the cross right maybe you need to lay something down at the cross so you can pick up the blessing that God has for you I don't know what it is, what decision you have to make today. You can make it where you're at, but I'll tell you this. If you make a decision to follow him where you're at, you're going to want to come down here and tell me. And you're going to tell everybody else too. Whatever you got to do today, do it now. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. God, I thank you for all these people who are here. I thank you for the generous heart of this church for so many decades and generations. God, I ask forgiveness for those times in our life where we found our value in what we give and not just joy in who gave us the greatest gift of all. 
And God, I pray that as we sit here today, Lord, I pray for feelings to be smoothed over. God, toes that were stepped on, God, I pray for comfort around us all as we stand here, each and every one of us, myself included, convicted in the face of the greatest gift that you have given us, salvation through your Son. And what I can give back to you, God, is nothing compared to what you've given me. And I give you all the praise and the honor and the glory for the things that you're doing at this church, for the things that you're doing in the lives of your people, for the things that you're doing in my life, God. May your name be high and honored forever and ever. And it's in Jesus Christ, that great gift from Bethlehem to Calvary to Easter Sunday. And it's his name that I pray. Amen.